Luis Suarez, Virgil van Dijk, Bruno Fernandes. Well, these players have changed their clubs and fortunes in the January window. Well, it's that time of the year when the fans get anxious to know the transfer news. Well, joining me today is from London, Ryan Taylor, the prodigiously talented journalist who keeps a hawk eye on the transfer news. Welcome to the show, Ryan. The transfer window is a little quieter this season, Ryan. Is it because of the COVID? Personally, I think uh, the pandemic has played a, a huge part on, on what's been going on in the transfer market. Um, clubs literally have just not had the money to spend in recent times due to the lack of match day revenue. Obviously, last season, 95% of the matches were played behind closed doors without fans. So if you take into consideration not only the ticket prices, but also the revenue the club generates on a match day through food and drinks, um, programs, things like that. So the finances clubs have, uh, have really suffered in the wake of the pandemic. And I think we're only just starting to see slowly now the market to recover into the levels it used to be at. Let's look at the biggest story of the week, Ryan. The postponement of Liverpool versus Arsenal was due to false positive cases, according to Jurgen Klopp. Do you actually believe him? Yeah, 100%. Um, it's something that has been a problem in the Premier League, not only in the Premier League, but general life as well, in terms of general people returning to work. Um, the, the testing system that's being used in the Premier League was it something called a PCR. Um, now, that takes uh, slightly longer to bring back the results. And what was happening was Premier League teams were travelling to away matches and still not receiving their results until they were en route to the match. And that's yeah. why we saw several cancellations just hours before the game. Obviously, fans were already on their way to the ground and they couldn't understand why matches were being pulled just two hours prior to kickoff. But now they're back to using something called lateral flow tests, which I'm sure you'll be aware of that. But it's basically an instant result, um, sort of five to ten minutes, and you have a clear result on that. Um, but they have been known to flag false positives. Now, what that means is the testers, of course, read in positives, and clubs are then going off normal po uh, protocol, which is isolation. Um, once players are isolating, obviously, they're staying away, away from the rest of the squad, not training, etc. cetera. Um, and it's not until several days later until they retest. Now, when they do that retesting, sometimes some of the positives that appeared turn to be negative. Now, in England, obviously, there's been a lot of backlash in regards to Klopp, Klopp's comments. Um, you know, what he's saying is just telling the truth. He's, um, he's been almost too honest. But obviously, the argument is in England that, you know, should this game have been called off if the Liverpool players weren't actually positive for COVID-19? And there's some suggestion, obviously, having lost Salah, Mane and Naby Keita to the Africa Cup of Nations, that Liverpool's numbers were slightly depleted, so they may have tried to get the game rearranged. But I don't believe that's the case. Do you agree with the EFL not to investigate this matter, considering that during COVID times, there has been a lot of pressure on the teams and it hasn't been a level playing field? Yeah, I believe so. I think pretty much every Premier League club now has been affected by COVID-19 this season in terms of outbreaks within their squad or cancellations. Um, I don't think there's any reason to question the integrity of Liverpool and Klopp. Um, like you said, they've just run by normal protocol. Obviously, it's slightly unfortunate Arsenal have been on the receiving end of that. The only kind of issue I would sort of understand and sympathise with Arsenal is the fact that the home leg of the Carabao Cup semi-final is now um, the second leg. So they were due to play Liverpool at home at first, but due to the rearrangement of that, they're now playing at home second. And obviously, you know, it would probably be preferable to play the home side first just to potentially build a lead. In your assessment, Ryan, what are you picking up on the Mo Salah-Liverpool extension deal, considering he's one of the biggest stars in India? He's an incredible player. And I think, you know, right now we're witnessing the best player on earth. Um, obviously, that's the title that's been held and shared by Cristiano Ronaldo and Lionel Messi. I don't think anybody can dispute that Mohamed Salah has been the best player, um, you know, in Europe and world football this season. I think he's got 16 Premier League goals in 20 matches. He's on course to win a third Premier League golden boot. Um, and I think he's well within his rights to um, say that he, he he's deserved um, a new contract currently on £200,000 per week, which is Liverpool's joint 
highest earner. Um, but as the contract trickles down now, he's he's literally placed the ball in Liverpool's court. He said he wants to stay. I think it's only fair that um, he's handed a contract that reflects his importance to the team. Um, and I believe he's asking for around about £300,000 per week, which would, of course, break Liverpool's wage structure and potentially see a number of his teammates maybe ask for salary increases. But I think on the basis of his performances this season, it'd be well worth it. Moving on to Chelsea, do you believe the Rudiger deal will come through or will he move on from Chelsea? So, Rudiger will stay put this month. Um, obviously, his contract's out up at the end of the season, but uh, there's no sort of question marks around his future for the, the next half of the season. Um, Chelsea's problem is they're not currently prepared to meet what he's asking in terms of wages. Um, he wants pretty much a bumper salary. And where um, players are free to sign pre-contract agreements with foreign club, which involves no transfer fee, the likes of Real Madrid and Bayern Munich, Paris Saint-Germain can use the money they would have used on a transfer fee to increase the contract. So that's why those sort of clubs are prepared to pay more than what Chelsea are offering for the next contract, even though Thomas Tuchel is desperate to keep him. Um, it's difficult to see where he ends up. I think it's clear Rudiger wants to stay ideally. Um, but at the moment, he seems to be heading towards an exit. Um, and I think Sevilla's Jules Kouande would be the man that they look to bring in to replace him. Well, Chelsea fans would like to know what's happening on the fullback situation. What are you picking on that story, Ryan? So, obviously, Chelsea were biding their time to see what happened with Ben Chilwell. He su suffered a ACL injury against Juventus in November. Um, they didn't uh, put him up for immediate surgery. They wanted to see how the injury reacted over time. Um, but now he's out for the season and has already undergone an operation. Rhys James is also out for eight weeks after suffering a hamstring problem. So they're now looking to sign a fullback. Um, they have looked at Lucas Digne from Everton, but he now looks set to join Aston Villa. And Chelsea's priority is now recalling Emerson Palmieri from his loan spell at Lyon. He's a player that's popular at Cobham. Uh, Tuchel really likes him. But the problem they have is they did not include a recall a, um, recall option in the loan agreement with Leon, And he's a regular starter for Leon, so, so they don't want to lose him. But Chelsea are now prepared to pay some compensation to the French club. Um, and they're hoping that could eventually see them bring him back to uh, play with Marcus Alonso. The other alternative would be to sign a right back. Right. Um, so Gino Des from um, Sergio Des, sorry, from Barcelona is yes. an option that's been considered. Um, but at the moment, the priority is to recall Emerson Palmieri. What are you making from the Lukaku Sky interview? Don't you think so? He shot himself in the foot. Yeah, it was. He pretty much shot himself in the foot, um, as the saying goes. Um, it's a difficult one because Lukaku kind of has a track record with these kind of comments when he's angling for a transfer. Um, but in England, the situation's very much diffused now. Um, so Lukaku's come back into the team and scored. He did an interview with Chelsea's website in which he was sort of forced, not forced, but um, given the spotlight to explain his decision-making behind some of the comments that he made. Um, it's led, we're led to believe he's not angling for a move back to Inter Milan. Although if his situation earlier in the season where he wasn't playing continued, that would be something he would be looking to explore. But Tuchel and Lukaku have drawn a line under it and the saga is pretty much over now. Well, you have Lukaku at one end and Paul Pogba at the other. And both of them are quite a handful for their clubs. Don't you think so? They've got themselves into a little bit of a problem right now? Pogba's... For me personally, um, I don't think there's any doubt about his talent, but uh, the situation at Manchester United has gone stale now. And from from a journalist perspective, the story's kind of got a bit boring over the last three years. There's sort of been constant to and fro in about whether he'll sign a new contract. Suddenly he comes into form again and loves playing for United and looks really good. And then he endures a dip, gets injured, and then it's back to square one of being out of the team, struggling to recover. Mino Riola maybe makes a comment that um, riles the situation. Um, but I don't think, like I said, there's any doubt about his talent. But 
to be honest, at the moment, I think it looks like Pogba's going to leave in the summer, but that could ultimately hinge on who comes in as the new manager of Manchester United and whether Pogba feels part of his plans. Let's understand the problem, uh, Ryan. Is it because of the players part or the agents who are getting greedier? It's a combination of both from my perspective, um, or my opinion. I think Mino Raiola doesn't help the situation. Obviously, he's had a really fractious relationship with Manchester United in recent times. Um, the situation with the manager also hasn't really helped Pogba. I think at times, Solskjaer was a bit too soft with him. He either needed to build his team around Pogba or effectively be bold enough to say, let's sell him. Um, there's been a lot of to-in and fro in and indecisiveness. Um, Pogba himself obviously hasn't helped. His injuries haven't helped either. Um, but I do think it's a combination of the factors. Let's stick to the Manchester United part. Do you think players like Paul Pogba were a part of the problem that actually caused his exit from Manchester United? Well, I think we're, we're now starting to see that maybe... Obviously, I don't personally think Solskjaer was the right man for Manchester United to win trophies, but we're now seeing the problem stem beyond the manager. Obviously, Ralph Ranić hasn't really um, hit the ground running as, as interim boss. And there do look like a lot of problems beneath the scenes, um, beneath the surface. Sorry, a lot of players seem to want out. See, they played Aston Villa last night in the FA Cup, but it wasn't the most positive performance. Um, United didn't play particularly well. There seems to be a lot of issues in terms of players not fitting the club's profile and, and there's no kind of clear uh, identity or, or style. You know, we see at Manchester City, Liverpool, Chelsea, there's a clear way of how the manager wants to play, but the players don't really seem to be buying into that at United. Well, Arsene Menger has already suggested a solution that to decide the players' uh, fee and their agent's fee well in advance. Do you actually subscribe to it? Yeah, I think FIFA are now sort of stepping up their efforts to uh, regulate agent's fees. Um, we saw, for example, two years ago when Erling Haaland joined Borussia Dortmund that the reason Manchester United missed out on a deal was because of the agent fees that Mino Raiola was demanding as part of the package. Um, obviously, there's a lot of greed involved with these agents controlling the moves of players. Um, it's kind of taken almost the decision, not entirely, but out of the players' hands. Um, negotiations are pretty much handled by the agents and the representatives, but obviously their main priority is to fill their pockets as opposed to often broker in the best move for their client. What are you learning on Aubameyang's situation right now? It's not something that's been decided yet, um, to be honest. I think the way our Mikel Arteta works is he has a leadership group. Now, what that consists of is all the players pretty much had a vote as to who they see the leaders of the dressing room. And now I think there was four or five um, of members of the leadership group, which is like... Um, you know, they organise the team from a, a training perspective. It's kind of the middle ground between the players and the manager. Um, so, Aubameyang is now out of the equation. Um, one problem Marteta has is obviously Granit Xhaka was stripped of the captaincy before. But he is now pretty much one of the main leaders of the dressing room after deciding to sign a new contract. Um, so, effectively, nothing has been decided yet. It's still very much a young team that is... Um, kind of lacking several leaders. Um, but they are slowly starting to emerge now over time as Arsenal sort of refine their identity. But at the moment, there's been no kind of decision on who will be the next uh, captain. Well, let's move on to Tottenham Hotspurs. Do you think Harry Kane is actually leaving the club? Um, it, at the moment, it's not something that's kind of a definitive, uh, definitive answer. Obviously, Antonio Conte arriving at Tottenham changed the equation in the sense that it would have given Harry Kane belief that the club can win trophies. That's all he's ever wanted to do, his dreams to win the Premier League title with Tottenham. And, you know, the message that's kind of been relayed to him is winning the Premier League or the Champions League with Tottenham would be worth more than any other achievement at any club in terms of winning two or three Premier League titles with Manchester City. Because obviously Tottenham is Harry Kane's club. The problem he has is how long does he wait? He's 28 now. Um, yes. He's he's arguably 
coming out the other side of his peak, given his goal scoring figures have dropped uh, significantly. Um, he does want to stay at Tottenham, but the problem is if he does not feel they're capable of challenging, then he will seek to leave again. Another issue he has is Manchester Manchester City obviously bulks at the, the asking price of Daniel Levy, which was sort of £120 million. Pounds. Now there's other strikers on the scene. Fiorentina's Dusan Vlaovic, Erling Haaland as well. So at 28, are City going to invest that money into Harry Kane, given they've just spent £100 million on Jack Grealish, who hasn't really uh, stepped up to the plate. So for, from Manchester City's perspective, there is a chance that the chance to sign Kane has been and gone, which is obviously something that will disappoint Kane. But at the same time, you know, Tottenham are better equipped now to compete than they were under Nuno Espirito Santo. Well, this is a fan question, uh, Ryan. Mbappe, Haaland, or uh, Harry Kane, who do you think is joining Manchester City right now? Um, I think Erling Haaland is the, the primary target now. Obviously, his £64 million release clause becomes active in the summer. And what that means is it will effectively be whatever club is willing to pay that um, and who wins the race in terms of convincing Haaland to join. So if three clubs paid that figure, it would be down to the clubs to convince Haaland who has the best, you know, sell and project. Um, City obviously can offer regular trophies. His father used to play for Manchester City as well. And there is talk that Haaland's next move is going to be to Spain as he wants to try La Liga. But City is certainly going to focus their efforts on signing Haaland, particularly at 64 million. But the other name, if they fail to do that, is Vlaovic from Fiorentina, who is, of course, um, one of the sensations of the season, really, given that he scored, I think, 16 Serie A goals in 20 matches. And he also equaled Cristiano Ronaldo's uh, goal scoring record in uh, 2021. And finally, some sick rumours about PSG and Ronaldo. Do you think Ronaldo will move from Manchester United to PSG? Yeah, it is, it is all imagination. I think the, the one thing we can say about Cristiano Ronaldo, though, is if things continue the way they are at Manchester United, he will consider leaving the club after just a year. Um, obviously, he, his main objective when he came back to the club was to win trophies. See, Manchester United look a million miles away from that now. And there's a lot of talk in England, you know, whether that be um, true or false, that Ronaldo is not, is almost, um, he's affecting the team negatively in terms of stylistically. You know, he, he doesn't press. Um, given his age, you know, he's, his focus is to score goals and lead the team. Um, but the overall balance of the team seems to have deteriorated since he arrived back at the club. Um, so ultimately, the next half of the season is going to be key. And if Ronaldo was to leave um, Manchester United, then, you know, based on general logic, Paris Saint-Germain are one of the only clubs that can afford his wages. And obviously, that invites the uh, proposition of Messi and Ronaldo playing at the same club for the first time ever. Well, we've spoken about the other clubs. Let's move on to Newcastle, the club with new investments and new monies. Who do you think they'll get after in this uh, transfer window? The problem is um, nobody knows because Newcastle were um, experiencing so many problems signing players. What's happening is Premier League clubs are not really interested in doing business with not Newcastle. First of all, the clubs at the top of the table don't really want to strengthen Newcastle, even though they're currently locked in a relegation dogfight. There's kind of um, behind the scenes, there's, there's not really a um, clubs. They don't want to um, do business with Newcastle since the takeover. And the clubs at the bottom of the table, like Burnley, their players, James Tarkovsky and Chris Wood, have been two transfer targets for Newcastle. But obviously, they don't want to weaken themselves and strengthen a relegation rival. And that's one of the reasons Newcastle are having to shop overseas. We're now seeing them explore the European market. Um, they've been after a centre-back, but Lille have said no about Sven Botman, the Dutch defender. Um, Diego Carlos of Sevilla has also been a target, but at the moment, Newcastle don't really look prepared to pay more than £25 million. The other issue Newcastle have, they need to strengthen immediately to beat relegation, but at the same time, they don't want to sign players that don't fit with their long-term strategy. Obviously, they want to be competing near the top of the Premier League. 
And at the moment, they don't want to panic buy, but at the same time, they need bodies through the door. And finally, Ryan, your prediction for this season. What are the top three predictions that you are going to make for this season? I think. So, Newcastle, I think they'll... I think they'll sign a centre-back. Um, I'll go with Sven Botman. The reason being, even though Lille have said no, Newcastle identified him as their top transfer target. So even though Lille were kind of um, refusing to budge and refusing to sell him, I think even though they've had two bids rejected, I think Newcastle will then up the money and maybe pay it. Uh, £35 million pounds or £40 million pounds just to get the deal done as we go later in the window. Um, other transfers, there is also a, a striker currently of interest um, to Newcastle, the Stad Rem forward. Um, I've forgotten his name. One second. Just because he's a new prospect. It's Hugo Etikite. Um, I don't know much about this player, but I know Newcastle are in talks with the the league on club, the French club. He's a, a teenage striker who scored eight goals this season and it looks like they're trying to get this deal done as well. See, like I said, Newcastle need as much money as they can and Etiquite is the man that they want to sign. And finally, I think Arsenal are going to sign a midfielder. I think Arthur Mello from Juventus is a player they're looking to sign on loan and Juventus need to clear the wage structure and the wage books at their club. Um, in order to bring in new signings. So I think Arthur Mello, who used to play for Barcelona, could potentially arrive on loan. Well, you heard it all from the man himself who's joined from London, Ryan Taylor, talking about the transfer news. This is Sunil Yashkalra signing off for Footcast Social, only on NewsX. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.